A hundred years ago, a vast locust swarm descended on Israel, and this is what one eyewitness, a schoolboy at the time, wrote. In 1915, the entire Middle East, from Turkey to Egypt, was invaded by swarms of locusts, the extent of which was said never to have been known in any part of the world. They appeared over Jerusalem about 2 p.m. in such density that they eclipsed the sun. Our headmaster told us to get tin cans and bang them to stop the locusts settling on our vegetable gardens, but nothing prevented them from devouring everything green, even the bark of trees, in minutes. They moved into every opening. We shut doors and windows tight, and yet somehow they managed to get through. Frightened, we gave up and retreated inside. For days, the sky, the ground, the streets, homes and shops were full of locusts until they had devoured everything edible. A hundred years on, and East Africa is now suffering the worst locust invasion of recent times. In Kenya last year, one swarm alone covered 930 square miles. That's 21 times the area of Newcastle, eating everything in sight. So no wonder a BBC report was entitled The Biblical Locust Plague of 2020. Because there are two locust plagues on that scale in the Bible. One is in Exodus when God sent a locust plague on Egypt as one of the judgments that would finally make Egypt release Israel from slavery. And the other is in the Bible book. We're starting a new series in tonight. It's the book of the Old Testament prophet Joel, which came out of a time when God sent another locust plague, this time on his own people, to wake them up to the dire state of their relationship with him. So before we jump into chapter 1, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking through the prophet Joel, not just to the people of his day, but for us as well. Please help us to see how his message fits our situation and speaks to our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you are at the in-person service tonight, Joel 1 is on your handout. If you're at home, it's in your Bible. Uh, would you please turn to it? We're looking at a wake-up call from God. And my first heading is the disaster. Look down to Joel 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Which is all we know about Joel. Unlike most prophets, uh, we're not told when he spoke for God and in the reign of which king. But putting the book's clues together, I go with those who think uh, Joel was probably preaching after God's people had returned from exile, after they'd rebuilt the temple, uh, but when they had no king anymore. So 500 years or so before Jesus, but that's not certain and it doesn't affect uh, what we get from the book. So verse 2, hear this, you elders, in other words, leaders of God's people Israel, give ear all inhabitants of the land, in other words, all the people along with them. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and, and their children to another generation. In other words, this is something you will tell your grandchildren. This is the once in several hundred years event. Verse 4, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. In other words, they'd been devastated by a locust invasion, like the 1915 invasion of the Middle East, like East Africa today. That is the disaster that, that they had been through and were possibly still facing more of. And Joel is about how God allowed that locust plague, or you can say sent it, as part of his plan to wake his people up to the dire state of their relationship with him. So Joel has two big working assumptions. Assumption number one is that God is sovereign. In other words, he has ultimate control over everything. And living this side of the resurrection, we have that ultimate reason to believe that Jesus, his son, uh, is now sovereign over everything, including death. So Jesus is Lord over locusts and the economic and political and social impact they have, just like he is Lord over viruses and the economic and political and social impact they have. 
And then assumption number two is that God is always working to bring people back into relationship with him. And living this side of the cross, we also have that ultimate reason for believing that second assumption because having given his son to die for our forgiveness on the cross, God is now working to bring more and more people back to himself through that forgiveness. And he sovereignly allows and uses disasters, whether national, global or personal, in that work. And many of us, I know, could testify to the way God either brought us to faith uh, or brought us back to faith or enabled us to grow significantly in faith through some disaster, large or small. And that was true for me through a broken engagement. For others, it may be through cancer or divorce or unemployment or exam failure, or through this pandemic that we're in right now. Because those old lines are true. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. So what was God saying to his people Israel through this locust disaster? On to heading two, what God targets through disaster. The book of Joel uh, has various clues that things were far from right in the way that God's people Israel were relating to him. Uh, most would have called themselves God's people, the Old Testament equivalent of saying, yes, I'm a Christian. But God sees the heart and he sees when other things are taking his place. He sees our attitude to him. And through this locust plague, along with Joel's words, God targeted what he saw in their hearts. And the first thing he targeted here is what people substitute for him. Look on to verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. So he's, he's talking about the locusts as if they were a foreign army. Read on, whose teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It's laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It's stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. So first in Joel's sights are the drunkards in Israel. I remember a hairdresser I often talked to about Christian things. And one time she asked me, you know, what I really lived for. And so when I'd said my piece, I asked her what she really lived for. And she said, well, you won't approve, but I live for the weekend when I can get completely drunk three nights running. So I said, um, if you don't mind my asking, why do you do that? And she said to enjoy myself because what else are we here for and to escape how awful life is the rest of the time. And just this week, I read some new research on drinking and those were its top two reasons for alcohol dependence, seeking enjoyment and seeking escape. And Joel knew that in his or her heart, the drunkard is really saying there's no God or purpose in life or life beyond this life. So I'll just enjoy myself as much as I can while I can, because what else are we here for? And alcohol for them becomes the way of seeking enjoyment and seeking escape from lack of enjoyment. And, and that goes for other drugs as well. And so through this locust pay, plague, God cut off the alcohol supply. No grapes, no wine. As if he was saying, you've substituted something else for me, so I'm going to allow the uh, substitute to be threatened or even taken away from you. Now, we know that's what God was doing through this locust disaster because he also spoke through Joel to say so. Whereas in the disasters, large and small, that we face today, we don't know with the same clarity what God is doing in them because we don't have specific words for each situation from him. So we have to be careful in applying this and look for what is true for all time about God and how he relates to us. And one thing that is true for all time is that when we substitute something or someone else for him, he often does allow the substitute to be threatened or even taken away. So maybe we substitute a relationship for him and he allows it to be threatened or even taken away. Uh, or we substitute career or status for him 
and he allows that to be threatened or taken away. We substitute something or someone else for God and he allows disasters large and small to threaten or even take them away in order to show us they were never going to give us the security and significance that we hoped they would and that only he, the real God, can give. And in a way, the verse 5 drunkards stand for everyone who subconsciously or consciously is saying, there is no God or purpose in life, no life beyond this life, so I'm just going to enjoy myself as much as I can while I can, because what else are we here for? And that's pretty much the basis of our society, isn't it? Which is why this life and the best possible health in this life are the ultimate blessings that we cling to, and why medicine and the NHS are the gods we look to for those blessings. And the Lord has allowed all that to be deeply threatened by this pandemic, to make us think again about our God substitutes. The next thing he targeted here is people's motives for worshipping him. Look on to verse 8. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. I remember a young woman at a previous church who lost her fiance. So one minute she was planning a wedding and a future with him. The next he'd fallen under a train in a terrible accident. That future was taken away. And that's the picture in verse 8. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom, i.e. fiancé, of her youth. Because through this locust plague, God had suddenly taken away the future blessings that they had planned on, which were more crops, more prosperity, uh, more of what we want. And they thought the way to get those blessings from God was simply to keep giving him regularly the, uh, the temple offerings that he had asked for, regardless of how else they behaved towards him. So they had the Aladdin's genie view of worship. Uh, rub God's lamp and it'll make him come out and bless you. And so through this locust plague, God cut off the offering supply as well as the alcohol supply. Verse 9 again. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord, the temple. So the grain offering was, was this mix of grain and oil offered with the daily sacrifices the priests uh, made on behalf of Israel. And the drink offering was wine poured over those same sacrifices. But read on. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. Why? Because, verse 10, the fields are destroyed, the ground mourns, because the grain is destroyed, the wine dries up, the oil languishes. It's as if God was saying, if you treat me like Aladdin's genie, if you think your offerings will make me bless you, regardless of how else you're behaving towards me, then I will take away your grain and your wine and your oil so you've nothing to offer. In other words, if your motives in worship are so self-centered, I will stop your worship. And what's true from that for all time is that we are equally capable of serving God self-centeredly for the blessings we get from him rather than serving him simply because he is God and he deserves our love and obedience. And when we do that, he often does still allow those blessings to be threatened or delayed or withheld in order to clarify and purify and restore our motives. For example, to clarify whether we're prepared to love and obey him regardless of whether marriage comes along for us or regardless of whether children come along in marriage for us or to clarify whether we're prepared to love and obey him regardless of whether our plans to get those grades, to get that place, to get that job actually ever comes off or to clarify whether we're, we're prepared to love him as the, uh, the marriage vows say, in sickness and in health for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, simply because he's God and he deserves our love and obedience. And then the other thing he targets here is people's sense of being in control. Look on to verse 11. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished 
The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. So now he targets the farmers. And remember, the Lord had given them one of the most fertile lands going. So it was easy for the farmers to think, well, we can do this. We can grow crops. We can uh, make the land do what we wanted to do. We can control our environment to our advantage. And into that atmosphere of self-sufficiency and self-confidence, God sent a billion locusts. In order to get across the message, verse 11, be ashamed, literally be humbled. It's like James in the New Testament saying, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit, yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. And there's no doubt that this pandemic has been humbling, hasn't it? There's no doubt that it's shown that Boris Johnson and other leaders may be in power, but that that's a very different thing from being in control. And in fact, it's been good and healthy to hear various politicians and experts saying in news interviews recently, one thing this has taught us is that we are less in control than we like to think. Amen, Joel would say. And it's taught us all that, hasn't it? Because even if, unlike Boris, we're only planning on a personal scale, many of our plans have been brought to absolutely nothing by this pandemic to remind us that none of us is in control of even the smallest area of life. The risen Lord Jesus is. And through disasters large and small, he wants to make us rethink who is really on the throne of this universe, us or him. So we've seen the disaster, what God targets through disaster, then a brief last word on what God purposes through disaster. So Joel's two working assumptions were, remember, number one, God is sovereign, and number two, God is always working to bring people back into relationship with him. And that was true even in the middle of this locust disaster, and it's true for all time, even in the middle of the disasters, large and small, that, that impact us. So look on to verse 13, where Joel says, Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. In other words, admit the state of your relationship with God, however dire or even non-existent it is, and then come to him in prayer, tell him you want that to change, and ask him to change it. I won't say more about that because Joel says much more about it in chapter 2, about how to come back to the Lord for the first or the umpteenth time, and how we can know he'll forgive and help us if we do. But for now... It's enough to know that just like he wanted the people of Joel's day back in relationship with him for the first time or, or back from straying, so he wants us to. Only we have the advantage of living this side of Jesus' death for our forgiveness and his resurrection to prove that it worked, which means that we can look back to the cross and know that through that God is always saying to us, whoever you are, whatever you've done, I'll have you back if you'll come. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you care enough for your glory and our good, not simply to leave us out of relationship with you or leave us straying in relationship with you. Thank you that you use the discipline of difficulty and even disaster to show us the real state of our hearts and to grant or restore or purify faith. Do this in us, we pray, so that the forgiveness and repentance which Jesus died to secure may be seen in our lives to your glory. Amen. So now let's have our final song.